Ladies and gentlemen, hello, Darkovica here, and oops, I just turned off my volume. We are back with another series. I wanted to really quickly explain something. God King R had a fantastic idea in my last video, um, so credits to him for this idea. But I believe what we are going to start doing is I pre-record these episodes on the weekend so that I have three to go out during the week whenever I actually do that. Uh, now, as we all know, I have a, a wonderful problem on this channel with consistency. I can't finish series. Um, and it's part of it is there's a lot of reasons why, and I'm not going to get into them at the beginning of this video. But we decide, you know, God King R suggested that I put a threshold to these videos to decide whether or not I should continue the series because obviously that would insinuate that people are actually interested in it. So the threshold is now 30 views uh, because obviously my channel does not get that very many views on gaming videos, which is not a problem. So 30 videos is, I think, a good threshold because if we obviously if we exceed 30 views within... I'd say within the week of that episode going, you know, the final, let's say the final episode going up, then I can decide, did you wave? <laughs> um, but uh, I can decide, you know, if I want to continue the series. So I think that was a really good idea, and it kind of gives me a sense of like a goal to hit to decide if, <laughs> if something is, uh, you know, obviously attainable or even if there's interest in it. So... I think we'll stick with that. So anyways, what is this? What do I have up? Um, this is Vampire the Masquerade Coteries of New York. And it was a very exciting announcement that this was coming out because, you know, obviously Vampire the Masquerade is a vaguely old game in terms of games in general. Um, and there's, it's been a very long time since the last one came out, which is kind of a cult classic def despite the fact that it's kind of a goofy mess. Uh, clothing doesn't really, you know, obviously the physics do don't really work, so it creates some pretty interesting stuff. It's a bit buggy. There's tons of mods that try to fix the game. Um, it was never, like, totally fixed, but that's kind of created this game that's, like... I don't know. People love Va Vampire the Masquerade. I love Vampire the Masquerade. Um... And I actually played the first one too, not on this- Whoa, I think I did one video on this channel, but that's neither here nor there. This vi this game is a different type of game from the first one. I think it's very much in a visual novel style of format, but um, it looks to be very promising, so I'm excited. Now that I have significantly talked for like three minutes about stuff, let's go ahead and dive in. So, here we get to choose our clans, because this would not be- <laughs> Uh, of Vampire the Masquerade if you could not choose your clan. So we could be Bruja. I'm pretty sure it's Bruja. And not just Bruja. Um, the Rabble Rebel Against... The Rabble Rebel Against Power and Rage Against Authority. A seemingly insignificant man with significant ideas will join their ranks. So we would be we would be playing this gentleman here. We could be the Ventru. The Aristotic Blue Bloods embody wealth, sovereignty, and control. A top level corporate executive will join their ranks tonight. Or Toreador. The Divas seek thrills of art, romance, and cruelty. Sorry, amidst stagnant undeath. I kind of like the. I, I want to be this lovely lady here. The, aris, the, the Aristocratic Blue Bloods embody wealth, sovereignty, and control. Hmm, she looks fun. I kind of like the idea of being a rebel, too, but I like her. I'm sad that I can't play a Malkavian. I am. Where's my Malk? <laughs> For those who don't know, Malkavians are insane. <laughs> they're, when they become vampires, they're pretty much just insane. There's also Nosferatu, which look like, if you've ever seen the movie Nosferatu, which is a classic, it's old, uh, they look like that. So they're not very good looking. They typically stick to sewers. They don't talk to people because to look on them is to know that they are monsters. Um, whereas the other clans can typically blend in with humanity. It's a very cool world. World of Darkness is what this is from, which is basically Dungeons and Dragons, except this. It's, you know, this is one of the expansions, which is vampires. There are many expansions to World of Darkness. World of Darkness is the core. Then you have vampires, you have mages, which I would love to see World of Darkness mages. Like, come on. I, I want that. I want it. Uh, there's also werewolves. Again, I want that. Give me my werewolves. There's not enough werewolf content. 
But, you know, there's there's a ton of different, like, expansions, and they're all really amazing. I've never actually played the game with anybody, but I really like World of Dark- World of Darkness. Let's dive in. I'm gonna be Ventrue. My name is going to be- I like- for some reason I'm feeling the name Marie. I don't know why, but we're gonna call her Marie. New York taught me to believe- oh, well, we don't know who this is, so I'm gonna give them my voice. New York taught me to believe in fate. Had you asked me about fate when I was human, I would have told you it's just superstitious bullshit. There's gonna be swearing. <laughs> Say that after I swear. Uh, that we are all designers of our own destinies. That belief shattered when the richest woman in the United States, the actual richest one, not a face you could have seen in the papers, of course, sank her teeth deep into my neck. It happened in the very same place you're standing in right now, by the way. Fate, you decide. Please, there's absolutely no need to be hostile. Just listen for a little longer. You see, my mistake was I flew too close to the sun. It makes sense that my punishment was to never see it glow again. I was incandescent myself. I was hot shit. I had it all. Money, looks, confidence, connections, men, women, a career and a spark in the eye. The one you need to be born with. And that's when someone far more powerful than me saw my radiance and thought, that won't do. She robbed me of the light erupting from within me and gave me a subtle, enduring gleam in its place. She decided it would fit me much better. She was a ninth generation kindred just like you, an apex predator. She probably enjoyed showing me a peak of human excellence, my real place in the food chain. It's such an eyesore when you look at some loudmouth braggart and see them for all they really are. The temptation to teach them a lesson can be unbearable, right? Well, my sire's lesson was a lesson about fate. A message saying, you're eternally doomed to being at the mercy of your sovereigns. It almost drove me to destroy myself. What saved me was the ability to reinterpret her teachings. Hers wasn't a message of doom. It was a message of hope. Fate exists, and one can shape it if given the right tools. My sire didn't believe my tools were fitting for the job. She considered them toys, and me, just her amusing subject. Well, she's deader than dead now, and I'm still here, standing right where she stood when we first met. You might have wondered how I've learned about your arrival to JFK Airport. My answer is, of course, destiny. As luck would have it, today happened to be a day of some of my associates. Oh, today happened to be a day some of my associates were inspecting the coffins. Driving you here straight from the plane and having you wake up in such an unfamiliar place was a little desperate, and I do apologize for it. But it is so rare for you to visit New York. Three times in the last 15 years, was it? And you're never eager to inform me you're here. I understand you still have that meeting on 53rd Street later tonight, so I'll provide a comfortable transport. I value our relationship very much, don't get that wrong. But it is precisely because I value it that I'm going to ask you to repay the favor you owe me. You're the only one I'd trust to do the job well, and without attracting attention. You might think I'm crazy, asking you to breach the rules of our society like this. You might think you won't get away with it unpunished, but this is New York. And I don't know about the other cities, but in this one, fate really exists. And right now, it's smiling in your favor. Dun dun dun! This is how it begins. Your phone rings. It's your boss. Again. The setting sun that filled your high-rise office an hour ago is gone. The city looks like an ocean of light from up here, spreading for miles to the north. You pick up. You were about to call it a day. Forget about the world of fintech and decompress at home. No dice. One of the investors wants to meet you. His voice, as always, the perfect mix of authority and sleaze. He'll come by your office in an hour. You look at the clock. An hour? He's gotta be kidding. Yeah, I know, but stick around. He's a heavyweight. You'll want to make a good impression. Fine. You grit your teeth a little. The boss hangs up. Two hours. Might as well pour another coffee into yourself and figure out how to best use this to your advantage. You suspect everyone knows that, no, you're actually not happy with your current position. That, in fact, you feel squished against the glass ceiling that comes with the territory. Sure, your idiot superior might have gotten the job only because he's the CEO's golfing buddy, but you, you're going to put an unholy amount of work into your advance advancement. 
times were, you'd laugh off the idea of staying at the office until 9 p.m. You had a partner to go home to, the, only, the nightly Netflix and chill ritual to perform, complete with pizza or Chinese takeout. Ever since you moved up the ladder, though, your hours have only gotten longer. Food? Mostly at the company cafeteria, sometimes takeout, always in a rush. You praise the heavens for your crazy metabolism and dread the day it finally decides to give up. That sounds accurate. Rest? At this point, the cleaning lady who takes care of your apartment probably spends more time in your bedroom than you do. You flash back to your boss quoting Shakespeare to impress his new, extremely attractive, and uncomfortably young secretary. For some must watch while some must sleep. So runs the world any so runs the world away. Drinks? Mostly with colleagues, and they all pretty much hate you at this point. Another flashback, this time to the most profitable quarter of the company's history. Still, the board decided that layoffs were in order. Your boss didn't feel like letting people know in person, so he passed that privilege on to you. Gotta hand it to him, he always knew how to pick his battles. But maybe, just maybe, tonight is the night it's all going to change. You decide to play the good looks angle. Nothing too slutty. You leave your blouse, blouse slightly unbuttoned. Check if your ass looks as good as you remember in your pencil skirt. Mirror says yes. It's not something you're proud of, but you've become too jaded to care. Knowing your luck, the investor is going to be one of two types. A self-obsessed musk wannabe in his 20s, or a fat old pervert drenched in cologne. You hear the elevator ding. Time to get this show on the road. You take one final look in the mirror and fix your hair as the footsteps echo across the empty hallway. The man who approaches your office is not what you expected. He's slick, to be sure, but he seems a bit more refined than your usual company man. Expensive suit, matching tie and shirt, confident in his stride, surprisingly good-looking. Good evening. I hope this unforeseen visit isn't too much of an inconvenience. God, that voice. You're taken aback by how smooth and strong it is. And his eyes, steel blue, cold, intense. He's all business, professional, treats you in a manner that's appropriate to your stature. When he speaks, he actually looks you in the eye and not at your cleavage. He asks some questions about your work, tells you how he noticed your input after talking to the CEO, another golfing buddy, and comes charmingly close to calling your boss an incompetent doofus. All the while, you try to guess his accent, but can't quite place it. European, sure, but where from? I know I've kept you long enough, but would you indulge me and join me for a drink? We all know what kind of drink he means. Of course. For a minute there, it seems like he wasn't that kind of guy. But what the hell, you go with it. He seems nice enough. Besides, it's not like you have other plans. The investor has a limo waiting downstairs, and the driver takes, to, takes you to a high-end restaurant in Williamsburg. A seat is waiting for you in the deluxe lounge. It's just the two of you. Well, this looks lovely. It's very high quality art. You talk about this and that. Your companion seems to have a knack for history. So, tell me, what would you do if you had full control of the company? You almost choke on your wine. This is your chance. You say what's been on your mind for months, but hide it behind a veneer of professional corpo babble. Refocusing, listening to your instincts for once. Restructuring, kicking out your boss. Aggressively pursuing new markets, getting the hell away from all these horrible people. He likes the sound of that. He leans forward. His eyes flash with intensity and something else. A strange emotion that wasn't there before. <laughs> You'll do just fine. His words echo inside your head as you black out. You wake up, God only knows how much later. As you try to piece together what happened, you hear a familiar voice, the investor, or whoever the hell he is, talking to someone. You suddenly recall snippets, fragmented memories, his sapphire eyes intently locked with yours, his teeth suddenly longer and sharper, and something else, a feeling on your neck that takes you back to your last orgasm. Oh my. A company trip to Florida, a sweaty room, the cutie from HR who doesn't work there anymore, and then darkness. Yes, I'm done here. Consider my debt repay or consider my debt paid. The investor pushes the other figure aside and walks away from the lounge, barely bothering to look at you. The door locks behind him. Well, there goes my sire. Some time passes before you find the strength to get up from the couch. You touch your lips. Blood. Did that asshole hit you? You try to stand up, but your head is pounding and your stomach is like a heavy knot pulling you down. You didn't have that much to drink. He must have spiked your wine. This is bad. You frantically check your clothes. Pristine. 
doesn't make any sense. All of a sudden, a feeling hits you unlike anything else you've ever felt before. You fall to the floor, writhing in an all-encompassing pain and hunger. The kind that makes your insides burn. That cannot be denied. You try to calm yourself down with a breathing exercise they taught you at some bullshit mindfulness course. Not so bullshit anymore. That's when it hits you. You're not breathing. And holy shit, should your heart be jumping out of your chest with that realization. But it's not moving. Not even a beat. The door unlocks. You hear a startled voice. A young man in a waiter's outfit, his accent thick with, East, with an Eastern European harshness, leans over and asks if you are alright. For a brief moment, you wonder what the hell he's doing there. Everything is wrong. Then a smell reaches your nostrils. It's intoxicating. Everything feels right again. He holds out his arm to help you stand up. You grab it, firmly, with both hands, and then you bite down. You sink your teeth right next to the old school pinup tattoo of Rita Hayworth and on his forearm. It takes you a moment to process what you're doing. A part of you wants to break away, but a stronger voice implores you to keep drinking. One thing becomes clear. You are definitely enjoying this. I'm into this. I like this. If you couldn't tell, I'm just sort of flying through it. He only struggles a little and quickly falls to his knees. You can see his eyes now, pale, blue, and confused. You only bring yourself to let him go once he collapses onto the floor. Your bite leaves a mess of his forearm. Poor Rita, all bloodied, missing half her face. Did you... Did you just drink this guy's blood? Oh. Well, we murdered him. You spit out a piece of torn flesh. Jesus! I like this, like, crazy, creepy screen. That's a... Why? Where? What was in that fucking wine? Barely able to focus, your heart and your lungs still motionless, you reach for your phone and dial 911. 911 operator, what's your emergency? My heart stop. I killed somebody. I can't breathe. My, I, I don't want to say I killed somebody because I feel like that's going to have some gnarly consequences. I know what's happened to poor Marie. Marie doesn't know what happened to her. We'll say my heart stopped. My heart, it's not beating. Ma'am, where are you right now? The door to the lounge slings, swings open. The man who enters is not the one who brought you here, though there are similarities. He's tall, for one. Broad-shouldered, handsome, dressed in an immaculate suit, but his skin is darker and the look on his face tells you he's not here to negotiate a deal. He notices the smartphone in your hand. Pass me the phone if you want to live. The man's voice is persuasive, calm, but carrying clear threat. He's got the aura of a viciously efficient corporate shark. You find it hard to argue with him. Ma'am? Hello? I apologize for wasting your time. My new colleague got drunk and is now trying to impress everyone with her antics. Good night. He disconnects the call and places your phone in his pocket. For whatever reason, you can barely take your eyes off the stranger. As hypnotizing as his presence is, though, it is also highly discomforting. Good evening, miss. I'm here to pick you up. He's very pretty. I like his hair. He's got good choice in hair. Pick me up. Call an ambulance. Who are you? Who are you? I'm your guide through this perilous night. The stranger approaches the waiter and examines his body. Critical condition, but he might live. Anyway, he then sets his sights on you. I know this is all new to you, but I've dealt with hundreds of strays like you, and going by experience, they tend to fall into two categories. First, there are the smart ones who carefully obey my every word and don't try to pull off anything stupid. I always get them th where they need to be, safe and sound. And then there are the dumb ones. The punks who thought they could take me on. The wise guys who tried to contact somebody secretly and without permission. The troublemakers who tried to run off or make a scene. None of them got to their destination in one piece. In fact, most of them never reached their destination at all. His voice becomes slightly bored and monotone. You can tell he's given this speech before. Likely dozens of times. So you see, while I generally consider myself pretty smart, I am also a Mets fan. I beg your pardon. It's one of my it's my one true weakness, one that inspired me to come up with a three strike system when dealing with pups like you. If you get on my nerves once or twice, well, I understand. Not all of us perform well in stressful situations, but cross me three times, and you're out. No excuses, no forgiveness, no mercy. As he's talking, he slowly approaches you, adding a bit of theatrical swagger to his walk. 
They're drama queens. I love it. Eventually, he leans in, deliberately invading your personal space. You realize it's a test. He's daring you to do something about it. Three strikes, and you're out. Say, I understand, sir. Now. Every atom of your being screams for you to obey his authority. Fuck you, sir. <laughs> what are you even talking about? Okay, look. We're gonna, we're gonna play along. We're gonna go with it. I understand, sir. Look at her. She's so cute. Stick to that tone, and you'll do just fine. We'll play along with their game until it, until it comes time to, you know, take over. Because I'm sure I'm going to get that opportunity. Moving on. Is there anything you want, you'd want to inf- Is there anyone you'd want to inform of your current situation? Tell them you're all right. He flashes his fangs briefly, and for some reason the sight sends a chill down your spine. There is something very wrong about him. Someone closest to you. My boss! Are they gonna go kill him? Are they gonna go kill him if I say my boss? I'd rather not answer. My boss, I suppose. The stranger squints at you. Forgive me. But am I to assume your prof your relationship is more than professional? You immediately give him a piercing glare. My god, no. Me and that pig? Don't be ridiculous. Ugh. He said you said he was the closest person to you. You asked me if I have anyone I'd like to tell I'm alright. The answer is yes. People at my office. I don't want to lose my job, so I'd prefer to let them know I didn't just go off on a bender. No family. No lover. No friends. Your blank stare tells him the whole story. He immediately stops prying and gives you something worse than a look of pity. A look of honest compassion. <laughs> How is that worse? Well, that makes things simpler, but let me be crystal clear, just in case. From this point on, you are subject to different laws than the ones you grew up under, and you'll be watched by many eyes to ensure these laws are respected. You are forbidden from letting anyone know you're still alive. You are forbidden from showing your face anywhere they know you. If anyone comes looking for you, it's over for both you and them. That practice tone again. You put on your poker face and listen in silence. So unless you want your boss to end up at the bottom of the Hudson, I'd suggest you cooperate. I'm sorry, is that an invitation? Because I'll go see him right now. <laughs> Don't tempt me. He smiles, revealing his fangs again. There's something absolutely sickening about it. Suddenly, you feel overwhelmed by a sense of exhaustion. You pass out. When you regain your senses, you find yourself in the stranger's arms. The man is holding you as you would a spouse who's had a little too much to drink. You try to break free, but he holds you close and gives you a cautioning look. Only when you cease your struggling does he let you go. Only now do you notice the change in scenery. You find yourself in a fancy lobby, right next to the elevator. The place is virtually empty, save for a single concierge and uh, some what? And some cleaning staff. Your companion gestures to the concierge as you pass, and he picks up the phone. All right, we're gonna go ahead and pause this episode here. I am into this. I really like this. I'm excited. I hope you guys are excited for this, cause uh, <laughs> I'm ready for some vampires, yo. World of Darkness is very gritty. It's very like, um, it's very dark. And the idea of World of Darkness is the vampire world exists in harmony with the human world. They're very careful about how they maintain their hunger. They're very careful about how they maintain their place in society because vampires are not perfectly immortal. They can die, uh, especially to things like shotguns or, you know, obviously silver or, you know, things that it will take a lot more to kill them, but they can die. So they try not to let the world know about their existence. So that's what makes World of Darkness really interesting. Um, vampires are not the most powerful thing. They are more powerful than humans, but they are not nearly so, um, they, they don't outnumber humanity and they don't really want to outnumber humanity. Creating a vampire requires permission. There's a whole thing. If a vampire goes out and just creates a child, um, their, they and their child will be killed pretty much. So it's a very like, it's a very dark world, which, you know, world of darkness. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this, and uh, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Bye!